as a society, we have developed astonishing confidence in our abilities and technologies to tackle with some messiest issues in our world. We struggle with many of the problems because we don't fully understand our problems. I would also say that we don't fully understand our solutions or the technologies powering those solutions. We use the word innovation to signify progress and change, to reflect the, pro the developments that we create in our own society. We overuse that word. We don't fully understand what it actually means. In Washington and Silicon Valley, innovation speak reigns supreme. Everywhere, innovation is the expected default that we're all expected to uh, conduct. Very few people can authoritatively speak about innovation, and fewer of them are actual innovators. Our speaker this morning, Steve Sasson, is one such engineer. Of course, he's world-renowned for his uh, creation of the digital camera that has transformed our life, to use that cliche. He's, of course, uh, been uh, recognized by President Obama with the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. He's an elected member of the National Innovators Hall of Fame and a recipient of numerous recognitions and honors. But he's still, as he identifies himself, a tall, grown-up kid who loves ice cream. <laughs> and he has a number of stories to tell, and he has a unique perspective on what we can learn from failure and fearlessness, which has been a theme of the Future Leaders Forum this year. Without Steve's creation, we wouldn't have modern life in a, in a significant way. We wouldn't recognize social media as we see it. Facebook, Twitter would cease to exist without the output of Steve's creation. The recent movie that I watched, Jurassic Park, would actually be child's play <laughs> um, without Steve's uh, creation. Digital cameras have become our modern ritual, a daily default, a visual anthem for how we represent ourselves. Digital photography conveys a sense of togetherness that we all come together as a society and how we portray ourselves to the world and for the future generations. It has transformed the way we look at presence and permanence. And to learn more about how the creation of the digital camera has transformed the person himself, you don't want to hear more from me. You want to hear from Steve Sasson. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your warmest welcome to Steve Sasson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Guru. Um, you know, just a couple of days ago, uh, to touch on something that Guru just said, uh, a couple of days ago I was in a, a fourth grade class. They study innovation uh, for a summer program. And one of the students asked me what my favorite food was. And uh, I said, ice cream. And he says, not chocolate chip cookies? So I'm changing it to chocolate chip cookies, Guru. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the advice of a fourth grader. Um, Hey, thanks for inviting me to the 2018 uh, IEEE Future Leadership Forum. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be here. Um, I do have a question, though. Um, future leaders, why wait? Uh, leadership is about now. It's about actions that take place now. Um, I know that there was a session yesterday about um, leadership. Uh, uh, I forget the title of it, but it was based on Kuznets and Pasta's Leadership Challenge. Did anybody attend that? Great, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, that's based on uh, the characteristics of a leader um, that they practice. And you'll find that if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, modeling the way, inspiring shared vision, challenging the process, enabling others to act, and encouraging the heart, those five practices, nowhere in there is uh, a mention of the age of the person or their rank in the company. Okay, it's practices that you do now. I, I will tell you that um, I worked at Eastman Kodak Company for 35 years. And uh, I started off with an idea about an all electronic camera. And I was uh, proposing this prototype camera. And at the age of 26, I was leading a change. Nobody told me I was a leader. But I was right in the middle of it. I wasn't a future leader. I was right in the middle of it, right there. And the idea wasn't universally liked, as you can might imagine. Um, 
I was, um, I built a prototype camera that took, took pictures uh, using a new type of uh, imaging device called the CCD area array had just become available. I applied some new digital technology to it. I mean, it was actually a great project, okay, for an electrical engineer. I mean, this was fantastic. I was doing all kinds of microprocessor stuff that had just come out of working with microprocessors, uh, DRAM, TTL CMOS logic, all kinds of driver circuitry, digital magnetic recording. This was an electrical engineer's dream. So I thought it was a really cool idea. And so I espoused the vision that I found out in my company wasn't universally shared. And that's where I started to learn that I had to develop a whole new set of skills in order to entice people, to invite people, to encourage people to think about a new way to, of photography. Now it took a long time to do this. It took a long time, uh, many, many years. Lots of technology had to be developed, but a lot of minds had to be changed, okay? And I found that doing these kinds of things um, uh, was the best way to get a new idea adopted. And, and I, I want to encourage you to follow the title of this leadership, this conference, to pick up on some of these, th some of these practices. You know, when I demonstrated the camera, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this, this, this thing. It's, it's kind of a contraption about the size of a toaster, pretty ugly looking thing. And, and uh, when I got it working, we started setting up demonstrations inside of the, the company. And um, what I did was I, I, I would walk into the conference room that was full of managers. I entitled my little talk, my presentation at the time, uh, Filmless Photography, which was like a really bad choice of titles, you know, given my audience. Um, but I would walk in with this and I would take a picture of the person sitting at the front on the right. Okay, head and shoulder shot, 50 millisecond exposure time captured the image, 23 seconds to record it to the magnetic tape. And so as I was, after I took that first picture, I described to the audience what this thing was. They had never seen anything like this. And um, then I would walk over to the person who was sitting on the left side and take a head and shoulders shot of that person. And then I would put the camera down in the middle of the table. And then um, I would take the tape out, put it into this special playback unit that we had brought into the room. And about 30 seconds later, up popped a picture. So here I was in Eastman Kodak Company taking pictures of the managers there with a camera that did not use film and did not use printing or paper. It wasn't a great way to get popular, <laughs> all right? Um, but it was a paradigm shift and I was very excited about it. And I thought when I introduced this, I said, because I'm a technical guy, I said, they're going to really ask me how I got all this stuff to work. Nobody's pulled this together, but this is really cool. And I saw lots of technical dis discussions. Well, I'll tell you, that never happened in any of the meetings I had. Okay. They didn't ask me how it worked. They asked me why I thought it was a good idea. Why would anybody want to look at their pictures on a television set? What would an electronic photo album look like anyway? And how would anybody get a hold of one of these dopey cameras anyway? Would there even be a requirement for a photo retail chain at all? Okay? So this is where the technical leads to the leadership. I saw that I wasn't convincing anybody by telling them how cool the technology was. I had to start to describe a future about how I thought this might work. You know, and asked about repeatedly how long I thought this prototype would take to develop into something that would be for the consumer. Because that was what I was proposing. It was a replacement for consumer photography. I didn't actually say it like that then, but that's what it was. Um, I had no idea, because I hadn't thought about it too much. And then I used Moore's Law. I had 10,000 pixels. I called up our friends in the research laboratories. They said, if you want a reasonably good picture, a million pixels, two million if you want color. So I used that ratio, and I came up with between 15 and 20 years. Now, that's a long time when you talk to a bunch of managers. It's not like making a decision and tomorrow we're going to see an impact. But what it is, is it's a leadership statement. It's a future statement. Okay. By the way, it wasn't a bad estimate. We launched our first consumer camera 18 years later. 
So there's a lot that goes into introducing new ideas and convincing people to do new things. And so I want to go back to that leadership um, discussion that you may have experienced yesterday and say pay attention to that. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be able to do, okay? You want to be able to um, you know, model the way. People are looking at you all the time. Um, remember, if you, if you don't believe the messenger, you won't believe the message, right? Okay, so you have to work at that, right? Um, inspiring a shared vision. Inspiring people. You have to appeal to their hopes and their dreams. Okay, you have to uplift them. You have to be positive. You have to be a uh, possibility thinker rather than a probability thinker. Right? That's the way they put it. Right? You don't just compute the odds. You say state the vision and you go with that. Right? Challenge the process. Everybody wants to challenge the process. That's going on all the time. The problem with it, you got to challenge with a specific purpose. Okay, sketch out your vision. Okay, specifically what you want to change. Okay, and then um, um, enabling others to act, which is probably one of the harder ones to do, I think, is because what good is it if, if you're the best practitioner in the world of your art, if you know the most about electronics, right? If you can't spread your knowledge and then allow those people who learn from you to practice it, your idea doesn't get any bigger then. So that's why enabling others to act is really important. Okay? And then the last one was encouraging the heart. And that one is about being positive and creating a culture of celebration. There'll be failures along the way. Okay? But you want to create a culture of celebration so that when you have small wins, you celebrate them. So these are the kinds of things I started to learn about and how to convince things, uh, things to go forward at Kodak. It took over 30 years to mature digital photography to the state it's in now, more or less. Um, and over that time, we had lots of failures. But I found that some of those attributes of, of, of leadership was something that I had to sort of learn to convince people to give it a try. So I'll, be, I'll, I'll end my little talk here with, with, with how I begin. Um, why wait? Start now. Good luck. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Steve, this is uh, my third interview with you. The first one, uh, I was very fortunate to feature you in uh, a book that I wrote a couple years ago. And the immediate uh, past one was for IEEE. Um, and uh, I've asked you a lot of questions. So this time, I want to specifically challenge you <laughs> in front of our friendly audience here. And uh, I want to particularly thank the organizers for giving us this fireside chat and for arranging the 100 degree we weather outside the, that oh, is so I appropriate that for this the one. Over here. I did. <laughs> so, uh, Steve, um, let me start off with this. Before you became world famous for your digital camera, you were also famous for something that you called a do nothing machine. What is it and where can we buy it? Thank you for bringing that up. Well, you know, I was a kid about 12 or 13, and uh, I got interested in electronics. You know, this was in the early 1960s, and, you know, the space race was just starting, and the idea of flashing lights and Star Trek. I love Star Trek. All good ideas come from Star Trek. <laughs> and one of those was, the, although the computers had the blinking lights, you know, and so I decided to um, uh, see if I could build something that would just blink lights, neon bulbs. And I found this little circuit in a magazine, and I scrounged parts from old te television sets that I picked up on the curb. And uh, I built this thing, and I, 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 I stole my father's, my father was actually the one that gave the name, because I stole his shaving kit box. Didn't mention it to him at the time. And I drilled the holes, put in the 10 bulbs, and I put all the circuitry behind it, bought a 90 volt battery, 90 volts battery, um, and uh, put it in there push the button and the lights would blink like this. And so I showed it to him, I was very proud of it. And he saw his shaving kit completely ruined. And he looked at me and he said, he was very encouraging though, you know, he said, what, what is that? And I said, well, it's my blinking lights. He says, what does it do? I says, well, I don't really know what it does. It just blinks lights. He says, we should call it a do nothing box. And so that's what I call it. It was my first project actually. And you recently rebuilt it uh, for the- I did. And uh, what did you learn from it? 
I learned you can't buy 90 volt batteries anymore. <laughs> you can't, you can get anything you want on the internet, but you can't buy a 90 volt battery. Oh. So 10 9 volt batteries wired in series. I, I built it up. They, they challenged me at the National Inventors Hall of Fame to, to build it. And I, I did build it and uh, it worked. I had to, I couldn't remember exactly how to figure out the rate. So I just did trial and error, but it, it, it worked. So you were at Kodak as a junior engineer and uh, you happen upon a CCD chip that your supervisor gives you and uh, uh, some magic happens and this prototype happens and you beautifully told the story of uh, how you went about recording uh, the expressions of the people in that uh, room and I also remember you saying that it was a really cold, cold room that you walked into. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that I really want to uh, get your thoughts on, and this is something IEEE and the engineering profession itself is largely concerned about. We think about, we worry about developing the engineering habits of mind. How do you go about really attacking a problem from the get-go and truly understanding it? And uh, your point about uh, not being a probability thinker, but a possibility thinker is so appropriate and uh, uh, powerful for this. Maybe uh, as a question, since there are a number of entrepreneurs in this room, um, why didn't you start a company? after you demonstrated the prototype? Well, I will tell you, well, first it was a different time. I demonstrated it in the, throughout the year 1976. That's when I demonstrated the prototype. And I received lots of questions. And um, I was surrounded by the smartest people involved with imaging in the world. Um, the Eastman Kodak Company, I could tell you the whole history, but anytime anybody in the world needed something to do with imaging, they came to Kodak, whether it was building cameras to go to the moon or to Mars or anything, they come to Kodak. And so I was surrounded by these people. So when I made my pitch of my device, okay, um, I didn't have all the answers. I was never the smartest person in the room. There were always world experts in there that were way smarter than me, okay? They were curious about what I did, but I didn't have answers to a lot of the questions. There was the questions I talked about in terms of impact on the people. There were technical questions as well. And so I would say we wrestled with the technical questions, and there was no better place to wrestle with those technical questions than inside of Eastman Kodak Company through about 1989. I ended up building a digital DSLR camera with the help of a real camera designer this time, Bob Hills. And, uh, and it looked just like a DSLR today, and it was one and a half megapixels, color filter array, image compression, burst, burst picture mode, and it was operational in 1989. We showed it to management. They didn't like it. They didn't want it. Um, that's where I knew I ran into cultural problems, okay? Mm -hmm. So between 76 and 89, the reason I stayed at Kodak was there was no better place to learn about emerging art of digital imaging. I worked ever since I built that camera in 1975. I worked exclusively in digital imaging my whole career. I never was able to tell anybody about it. I, I didn't even talk about that camera that I just described to you. I wasn't allowed to publicly talk about any of that work until 2001, okay? Because at the time, Kodak didn't want to be associated with digital imaging, but then in 2001, because digital imaging now was becoming mainstream, it was uh, advantageous for Kodak to admit that they invented it. So, um, <laughs> So, you know, you run through different, you, you, I, I've seen the gamut of that throughout the company. So, th I didn't start a company, uh, and then I got discouraged in 89, and I considered leaving the company. Um, I, I seriously applied to some other places. Um, but then I got a chance to do something new with printing, thermal printing, and uh, I built the first small plant and thermal printer for Kodak, which ended up being the basis for the kiosks. So, if you get your picture printed at any kiosk, Mm -hmm. or even at a drugstore anywhere. Well, you're using that technology. We developed that in 1990. It took me a three-year effort, and I learned a lot about commercialization there. Mm -hmm. I had done research and advanced development up to this point. So I did real commercialization, and I did that for several years, got dangerously close to manufacturing. Um, and, um, so I, and then after that, I, I got involved with intellectual property mm -hmm. and, and licensing and litigation, and I testified in, in National Trade Commission cases and stuff. So, I will tell you that my, I don't regret my experience or my career at Kodak at all. Um, I, I got the best education. I was surrounded by the smartest people in imaging. I learned so much about it uh, at that time. And I think if I had managed to start a company, I would have been bankrupt <laughs> if um, I tried maturing this technology any time before 1998. Mm. And, that, and that time, at that time, I was you know, any, um, close to 50 years old. So. Let me invite your thoughts on the general nature of ideas and technologies as such. Um, Vint Cerf, 
uh, was our keynote speaker at the previous Future Leaders Forum. And uh, yesterday we were privileged to have L Larry Hornbrick, uh, Academy Award winner uh, for his technology. And uh, Larry used uh, an interesting phrase, uh, digital menace. And uh, Windsor very recently uh, reflected on uh, for a question that he was asked saying that he did not uh, anticipate the consequences of his co-creation of the internet. And uh, so this is a question to an engineer, um, to a technologist, and a person who deeply cares about society. Did you have any idea about the consequences your creation could potentially unleash? I know it's an unfair question, but please give it a try. Thanks. Um, uh, well, I would say slightly yes and mostly no. Um, yes, in the sense that uh, I like the idea, even back when I was proposing it, that um, as much as film was you know, profitable for the company and everything else like that, it still was an environmental challenge. I mean, there were a lot of chemicals associated with this. We, the silver recovery was a big business. Um, and so by eliminating that, I thought, well, that's making life a little simpler, mm -hmm. a little bit better. Now, I had no idea that uh, about the internet and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if, if even personal computers were, were going to be avail uh, available to everybody. You know, when I was proposing the camera, you know, I was challenged a lot, and I had to use analogies. And so I used analogies at the time to sort of project to the future. And uh, a lot of young people here, so you're probably not going to recognize this. Does anybody remember the HP 35 calculator? Somebody, please thank you. That two <laughs> thank you. I, I counted fewer two people. and fewer. Um, but anyway, it was the first calculator. It was kind of an engineer's tool, plaything, whatever. And so what I said was, well, I, what's the future going to be like? It's, I said it's going to be a calculator with a lens. That's <laughs> the way I described it. Okay? And then at the time, it was 76, and Jobs and Wozniak were proposing their, their Apple computer. It was a board that they were selling. It was selling it for about six, $700. And um, uh, I said, and I got interested in that, honestly, not because of that, but because Wozniak used the same DRAMs I used inside of my camera. And I used them in a very unconventional way, and I was interested in how he used them. So I, that's kind of why I got interested in it. But I said, well, these guys in California are building these computers that anybody can put power supply to and build it so it'll be a computer. So the playback system will be like a computer like this. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what I was challenged. I was challenged by the marketing guy in the room. There was always one or two of them. And um, he said, so how much does that calculator cost? And I said, well, about $400. How much is the California boys co cost? It's about six, seven hundred dollars. So for eleven $1 hundred dollars, you can take worse pictures than an Instamatic loaded with film is thirty-five dollars. Why are we talking about this? I remember that. Right? I didn't have a good answer mm -hmm. for that. Right? So I didn't really know. To get back to your question, I really didn't know the, the the impact this would have, and I don't think you really ever know. I just recognize that, especially today, and even back when I, when I was doing this. The world's inventing along with you. The internet was being proposed. Uh, low cost home printing, color home printing was being proposed. And all these things were going to come together in the future. And you combine things. I, I had the privilege of, of, of meeting Marty Cooper in London a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were at a ceremony. And two of us ignored most of what was going on. We stood in the back and talked. And, and uh, we, um, uh, we were arguing about which company was worse to work for. <laughs> but anyway, um, I digress. Um, the, 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 we, neither one of us ever thought about the combination of, of the two things. Right? Now, now, there are more pictures today taken with cell phones than still standalone cameras. Right? Uh, and, and, and when you go buy a camera, a, a, a cell phone today or, or a smartphone, what do they advertise? They advertise the camera. Right? Now, I never thought of that. Marty never thought of that. Right? So these things are. Things are moving so fast, it's hard to project. Okay, so I, it would have been a fun moment when people took uh, selfies with you and Marty uh, together. We, yeah, we the did. Digital camera and uh, the cell phone actually, together. Actually, people sort of ignored us there. Uh, we, we, we just, uh, we do have a picture of us together. I have one of them. Very good. I think I sent it to you, did I? Yes, okay. you did. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, um, I mean, setting selfies aside, and I think your yeah, creation is also, <laughs> yeah. your, your creation is also. I never real. thought of selfies. <laughs> That's not my thing. You didn't think of self-driving no. cars, did you? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. No, no. <laughs> but the selfie thing, I go blame for that a lot. I, I, uh, Are you I, the inventor of selfie? No, no, no. I, I, I got to honestly tell you, it's like, you know, get a chance to talk to people. 
that never occurred in my wildest dreams, that people wanted to take pictures of themselves. It just didn't happen. You know? And so when this gets proposed, that I, I just, it's an aberrant. I don't know. <laughs> no, in addition to your camera, thanks for promoting a culture of narcissism. We're yeah. very grateful <laughs> to you. But, uh, thanks. This interview is going well, isn't it? <laughs> A serious question in a way, I mean, to go beyond the technical and the marketing dimensions of your technology. I mean, it's, your, your technology has played an integral role in, in social movements, starting from Tiananmen Square to Black Lives Matter. Um, how do you process these elements? So maybe start with the Tiananmen Square. What were you thinking when you first saw those images uh, on the TV screen? Yeah, uh, to fill in the backstory on that one, we, we have built a, an image compression device. Um, I work with Dr. Majid Rabani at Kodak to come up with something that would compress an image um, and send it over a telephone line and have it reconstruct and not be able to see the difference between the one you captured and the one at the other end of the telephone line and to be able to do that in under a minute. Now, we were doing this and proposing a transceiver type device. I couldn't care less about the device. I wanted to see if we could get this technology out of the lab into an actual product so that we could eventually build a camera with it. But we built this one product and we, and we put it on the market. It was the first time any of our uh, digital imaging type of high tech stuff actually appeared in the marketplace. It started in 1987, it was being sold. It was bought by CBS News. CBS News had these and then when Tiananmen Square happened, they shut off all the formal communications for pictures getting out. They didn't know about the, the, uh, the transceiver. And then they were able to get uh, great pictures out from CBS. CBS was the only people to do that. And they, were, uh, they really scooped everybody, all those pictures of the guy in front of the tank and everything. Um, and so um, they wanted to do a story about it, uh, a television. Uh, uh, they were so excited about it, they wanted to do a news story about the device. So they went to Codex and said, we want to tell a story about your great device. So what does our marketing say? No, don't do that. You're going to offend all the conventional photographers that bought our film and can't get the pictures out. And um, so, you know, here's the, you know, this is the kind of insanity you deal with. It. You, here you have a national news organization who wants to give you a free three-minute advertisement about your new technology, and you say no. Right, well, it turns out we had a really imaginative leader. Uh, his name was Dr. Brad Paxton. And he talked management into saying, well, we won't mention the name of the product, um, but we'll just show it on the screen. And then, of course, on the screen was our splash screen, Kodak, transceiver, you know, so the message got out. Um, but when we saw that, I had no idea mm -hmm. that it was going to be used for this. I thought they'd sell a few for law enforcement and real estate, and, and that would be it. Um, but then I saw that. I literally was in a lab. I was watching this thing. I said, holy smokes. You know, something we did here is actually making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. you know? And it was, it, was, it was shocking to me, right? Um, we were very low key. We weren't allowed to advertise this stuff. We weren't allowed to do papers on it. We couldn't talk about this stuff. And all of a sudden, it's out there in the world is, you know, seeing this stuff. So that was like the first time that it hit me, you know. And then, of course, over the years, uh, it became more and more part of it. And uh, um, I, you know, I, all I can say is, is that I'm, I'm as amazed as anybody else is as mm -hmm. to how far it's hap gone and uh, how ubiquitous it is. I bet you all of us here have been photographed about five times before we got to this point today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some camera somewhere, you know. Uh, I would have never guessed that. So it's impacted society, mm -hmm. and as I was speaking this morning, I think it's maybe making us more well-behaved mm -hmm. because we're always on camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but other than that, I don't think I could have ever predicted uh, the impact. No, I think your technology has also uh, kindled a renewed sense of curiosity among us. Uh, once you gain an ability to see things in new ways, you often discover new things, and this goes back to the very um, ancient parts of our history, telescope, microscope, mm -hmm. um, underwater photography, yeah. Hollywood, you name it. What is, the, what is your most favorite thing that has been discovered using digital photography? Oh, well, first of all, I don't know if I can, begin, we can't even begin to claim any credit for this, but I just think the pictures from the Mars rovers are just unbelievably, mm -hmm. I, just, I just, I get shivers every time I see these pictures, okay. Uh, not to mention, you know, the outer space pictures from, from Hubble, and mm -hmm. Hubble's been modified several times and stuff. And uh, uh, So I, I, I think the, the space exploration, the idea of being able to see in a place that nobody's ever been mm -hmm. is, like, really cool to me. It's somehow this, 
this replacement for our eye, mm -hmm. uh, it gets projected to some far location. And then mm -hmm. we can, as human beings, see that mm -hmm. here is, um, is extremely cool. Mm -hmm. We've never been able to do that before. So, so we can now sort of appreciate our universe a little bit more than that. So that's the first thing that comes to mind for that mm -hmm. question. I have too many lawyer friends in Washington, D.C., and oh. uh, they're, uh, uh, some, many consider uh, their highest honor would be to even argue the most stupidest thing in front of the Supreme Court, and uh, let alone in front of a giant like a late uh, Justice Scalia. And I understand from my advanced intelligence network that uh, you had an argument with Justice Scalia, and you actually won. What is that? I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a little disagree. Well, let me, let me, okay. I have to talk to you later. Um, what, what happened was, uh, I, the last few years when I was at Kodak, I was asked to get involved with patent litigation and licensing. Um, so it was a real U-turn for me in my career. And I went and I sat among patent lawyers. And I helped plan cases, figure out arguments. I testified three times for International Trade Commission cases in Washington. Uh, so I got really immersed in the legal defense of patents, whether for licensing or for infringement. And um, so then I was invited to RPI, my alumni, uh, to, 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 uh, to be on a panel and Antonin Scalia was on the panel as well. And which will remain a constant source of embarrassment to my wife is that once I get a question in my head, I can't stop. And Scalia was on the panel and I simply asked him, you know, for patent cases and digital and all that kind of stuff, how do you guys deal with this stuff? I mean, how do you, how do you uh, use pictures as evidence because pictures are becoming more and more mm -hmm. a, a, a result of an algorithm rather than an event. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, so, uh, he, he, and, I, and I, Shirley Jackson is the president of RPI. I, I saw her look at me when I asked the question, haven't been invited back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't resist because I'm just really curious because I see the way, I've worked with lawyers, I've been in, 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 in the legal system and um, uh, he, you know, he responded, I, I, remember, I remember his answer, he said, well, he looked at me and he says, well, he says, I, I don't know if that question is above my pay grade or below my pay grade, <laughs> but I don't, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer. And then some of the other people on the panel answered in, which were really not good answers in my opinion. But anyway, we, we had, um, the argument continued backstage, um, not argument, just I told him that I thought the appeals court system in the United States was pretty dumb. And, uh, well, because when you appeal a patent case, it goes to this appeal. The people who evaluate patent cases are not patent lawyers. They don't know much about the technology at all. So, I mean, as much as the lawyers are smart or they appoint special masters, when they hear the term special master, they're bringing in somebody who's an expert or supposed expert, right? And I've seen them bring in special masters, but, you know, if you're doing a digital imaging case and they bring in a special master that's a chemical engineer, it's probably not going to help that much. Um, so I, I pointed that out to him, and it turned out he agreed with me, and he argued with Scarza, who was an appeals court judge. He says, I told you this system stunk. Here's somebody who thought, <laughs> honestly, that, that conversation really took place in the hallway back there, really. So yeah, that was my argument. But you're right, all my lawyer friends are very jealous that I got a chance to talk to Scalia. They really are. They're, <laughs> and they're override kind of, him. They're kind of embarrassed for the profession, honestly, yeah. uh, but, it, but it, was, it was fun. <laughs> and and he, was, he was actually, he was very nice, very witty guy. Mm -hmm. smart guy. Thank you. I think we're ready to take a couple of questions from the audience, but that's okay with you, Steve. Sure. But I have a question while the audience is getting prepared for some questions. Um, IEEE relies on volunteer energy and that commitment, and that's yeah. what drives the organization. And uh, uh, we build role models, um, good leaders, good followers, through the unique network that we have. You're a very busy person, and I, I know you take your volunteer work very seriously. You strive to be a role model for the younger generation. You volunteer in camps, invention camps, and so forth. Why do you take that seriously? Why is that uh, so meaningful to you? No, that's our hope. I mean, the, the future generation is our hope. Uh, and I want to encourage people to think out of the box. I think sometimes we get so efficient in education, and I don't want to get off on the whole thing on education, but. People get afraid to make mistakes. 
um, they're afraid they're going to be criticized or graded or measured in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw this a lot in the legal profession. It, it was, you know, they never have to make a mistake. They never ask a question they don't know the answer to. Um, it's a lot different than how I think we make progress. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I want to encourage young people um, to, to try things, uh, to, uh, to, to not be afraid of making mistakes. Um, failure isn't a verdict. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was wrong. I'm wrong most of the time. Uh, I like to say that inventors know way more about why things don't work than why they do, because <laughs> uh, they spend so much time on the wrong side of that. Right? Uh, so uh, I think it's important. And I think like conferences like this, where you talk about some of the simpler things, but they're really important about how to treat people, how to encourage people to, to do things to help you, how to build teams. These are all things that are really important, and I've seen it in my career. I've seen really smart engineers propose really good ideas, and they go down in flames for some of the reasons that I just mentioned. Hmm. And so uh, I want to encourage people to avoid that by learning some of these things early on. Uh, you'll be able to make a bigger influence. You'll be able to extend your influence further, which is kind of the object of why you're here. Stu, our first question is from past president Karen Peterson. No, we have about we have time to take about two questions. Right. So, first two hands up. All right, I see one here and one there. Hello, my name is Shadali, and I have a question for you. You mentioned in your first fifteen talks in the end that why wait, lead now, and you also mentioned about the story where you had presented an idea which got rejected because of cultural reasons or any reasons. So, how do you lead? At, when, when you're young and you want to lead, but your idea has been rejected at the very moment. So how are you going to lead ahead? I mean, isn't it necessary that you have to reach a particular position, a particular stand in a company to lead, to lead the crowd? Because your idea, whatever you project, is not going to approve because you, you just started your career. So how, how, how do you tackle that? Okay, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and and I, I understand why you're asking it. Let me encourage you from someone who's gone through a career. Most of the people who are rejecting you and your idea are jealous of you. <laughs> they would like to be young again. Wow. <laughs> so remember that, OK? They, they, and they're usually pretty smart people that are pushing back on it, probably smarter than you. Right? However, your youthfulness and your passion and your enthusiasm are infectious. They don't have a counteract for that. And by the way, they may challenge you just to see how good you are, how good your idea is, how robust your idea is. And remember, not every idea is that great. Mm -hmm. So your idea will inevitably in be influenced by the very people who are re rejecting it. Okay? They will, they, will, they will influence it somehow. So be open to that. But never stop pushing. And secretly, they don't want you to stop pushing. Hmm. They want you coming in your, that office every month or whatever it is. Let me tell you the new idea I have, or the modification of the idea I had before. I was never shut down at Kodak for, for digital imaging. Okay? I was allowed to work on it. I built, like I said, I did digital imaging for my whole career since 1975. They never said no, OK? I'll share one story. One of the guys who, 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 who came to look at my prototype was the head of all the manufacturing for all the equipment at Kodak, cameras, projectors, everything. And he came up to see it. We took his picture. He looked at it. And then my supervisor, I wasn't really allowed to talk with him, you know, because they were kind of hierarchical. And uh, I showed him, took his picture. But as they were walking out, my supervisor told me this story afterwards. He said, I asked him, should we continue working on this? And you, you know what he said? He said, Yes, and I hope you fail. And he walked out the door. <laughs> yes, and I hope you fail. There's bias, and then there's the people who can see where it's going. Even if though they're saying no, they're waiting for you to push back. Hmm. Because if you keep pushing back, it's a good idea. And you've got more energy than they do. Next one. All right, so Steve, 
First of all, thank you for such an inspirational talk. Um, Who's talking? I'm sorry. Uh, Aisha, right here. <laughs> oh, you are right in the light. Yeah. All right. It's an okay. optical problem. Okay. All okay. right. All right. Sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you for such an inspirational talk, by the way. I'm a really big photography fan, so I do a lot of photography, so this was great. But, um, so I know we learned that you don't like selfies, but I'm curious, what is your favorite use of your invention? How are you using digital camera now, and do you envision some other uses for it in the future? Hmm. How do I use my digital camera now in yeah. the future? Um, you know, I, I, I know a lot about how it works, but I, I, I'm not a very good photographer. Um, I, I've been very fortunate to meet world famous photographers. You know, never, I was on a lecture where several photographers at National Geographic got up and spoke and tell stories, and then I was the last one to speak. Never do that. <laughs> never. They're really good at storytelling. And so photographers see the picture before they take it. Yeah. You know, I talked to, talked to Steve McCurry one time, and he, the guy was, it's amazing how he thought about photography so different. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not going to say that I, 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 I like, I, I'm a great photographer at all. I'm not. Okay? Um, however, I do like taking pictures. So I take pictures of animals. I love taking pictures of animals. I have five acres of woods, and I, I love when deer, fox, coyote come by, and I try to get a picture, you know? I'm not one of these guys that's going to sit out in the rain all night waiting for them to walk by. Okay. Um, but I will, I will try to grab a shot. And, and one of the things I'll do is someday when I sell my house, I'm going to make up a little book of all the animals I took in my yard so that when somebody buys my house, they'll say, I'm going to call it the friends of my house, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and do that. So that's what I like to do. I like to take pictures of animals and stuff like that. I, I don't like taking a lot of equipment with me on, on uh, vacation because it's just a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, I'll use this cell phone. Steve, uh, just to yeah. wrap things up, uh, here's my final question for you. Uh, let's say you're throwing a dinner party and uh, you want to invite uh, about three famous people from history, or dead or alive, that you would like to meet. Who would you invite and what would you ask? Three people to invite, okay. Dead or alive. Famous Dead artists, artists, philosophers, writers, engineers, okay. politicians. I think you asked me a question on that when I wrote some notes on for this. And uh, I just read the biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I didn't know much about him. Um, other than that, I actually went to Paris and I saw the Mona Lisa, you know, to check out if what they were saying was true. You took a photo off that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> My wife says I'm such a tourist. Um, uh, but, but the way he thought about images, the way he thought about painting, he had nothing to do with photography, but the way he thought about looking at images was really quite mind-expanding for me. He, 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 he wanted to paint an accurate depiction of, 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 of what was there, extremely accurate, right? And yet he also wanted to show motion in there and show what mm -hmm. the, the feeling was, right? And so he tried to do this kind of thing. And, and so the, it, Walter Isaacson's book on Da Vinci, if you're interested in imaging at all, read it. It's just really fascinating. So I would invite him, OK? Um, I would invite Albert Einstein, too, because I just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a physics guy. And, and, and what he thought about and the results of his magic month of writing all those the, the three mm -hmm. great theories was just, how does somebody think like that? Uh, I would find that. And then probably Steve Jobs, because I would really like to know how a guy who was really not very nice gets so much done. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, you know that. He, his personality was a little bit left to be desired. And yet he did, he, did, he did an incredible amount. And so as much as I tell you about the, the, the enabling others to act and, and attributes of that, I would say he didn't necessarily practice all of those things, but he did get a lot done. So I'm always interested in counterexamples of what I believe. Steve, uh, your work has uh, clearly taught us more about ourselves to us, and uh, your work has made us uh, better tourists as we live through our temporary existence in this world. And uh, in a way, you have redefined what permanence means. We are all very grateful for your work. And on behalf of IEEE, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.